Part one. You will hear a conversation between a computer technician and a woman whose computer has crashed. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, Tom's Computer Maintenance. How may I help you? Hello, I am、um, seem to have a problem with my computer. It's really inconvenient too because I have a deadline tomorrow. I'm rushing to meet, and suddenly the screen went blank. Blue, a blank blue screen. I don't know if you can do something about it. Ah, the dreaded blue screen. <laughs> I think I can do something about it. It's my job after all. There are a few different scenarios, though, that could be going on with your computer. You've、uh, tried restarting it, right? Oh yes, nothing. And it's plugged in, not running on battery. Yes. Are you sure? Can you check again? Okay. Yes, it's plugged in. Okay. Can you give me a bit more information about what happened? The screen went blank. No, I mean, what activity were you doing when the problem occurred? Your computer was on, I presume. You were working, right?、Uh, what did you do immediately before the blank screen appeared? Were you using the internet? Oh yes, I was. Is it a virus? That seems likely. Uh, what antivirus software are you using?、Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, how embarrassing! Never mind. I'll have to come and have a look at your computer. Okay, that's great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. All right.、Uh, let's see. What about tomorrow morning about ten? Oh no, that won't do. I'm afraid. I've got a very important project on the computer that absolutely must be finished and handed in by nine a.m. tomorrow. By ten, it's too late. I'm afraid. Can't you come now? Well, I'm at a job at the moment, and my wife and kids are expecting me home by eight for dinner. Can you at least suggest someone else who can work? I know it's Sunday evening, but surely there's somebody. I mean, people have emergencies. I've been calling numbers in the phone book, and you're the only one out of about twelve that even answered. Just a moment, don't panic. Where are you located? I'm in the Morningside area. Well, you're in luck. I have to pass your area on my way home anyway. Now I should be finished here by half past seven. So what about around seven forty-five? Is that okay? Oh, that's great. Thank you. What's your address? Fourteen Branston Crescent, two F three. That's B R A N I S T. No, sorry, B R A. N S T O N Crescent. Oh, all right. And your name? Sandra Sarenson. That's S A double R E N C E N. And the name on the buzzer? The same. All right. I'll be there shortly. Thanks. Uh, can I ask you how much it's going to cost? Certainly, my call-out fee is sixty pounds, and that covers the first hour's work. And after that, the fee is forty pounds an hour. Oh gosh, that's rather expensive.、Um, how long do you think it will take? If we're lucky, it will be fairly quick. Honestly, though, if it takes much more than half an hour, I'll have to finish it tomorrow morning. But I doubt that will happen.、Mm, I hope not.、Uh, will you take a check, or do you prefer cash? A check is fine. Okay, so I'll be waiting. Okay, bye. That is the end of part one. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will now listen to a talk by the water project manager of a charity called Charity Water. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. As Charity Waters Water Project Manager, I travel to some of the most desperate places on Earth in search of clean water. And while the landscape changes, there's always one thing that remains the same: the women are always walking. Whether I'm in the mountains of Haiti in rural Liberia or the jungles of the Central African Republic, the women are always carrying water. To give you an idea of the work that Charity Water does, I'll tell you the story of one of these women. Driving down a bumpy road in the middle of northern Uganda, our truck suddenly swerves off the road and up over an embankment. We usually prefer to surprise communities by our arrival, because it makes it easier to monitor how our water points are functioning, without hundreds of people watching. But once you visit a few communities in the neighbourhood, rumours of your presence spread like wildfire. We jump out of the truck and walk into a party. This is when I met Helen Apis. She told me about the new freshwater well in her village. I am happy now, Helen beamed. I have time to eat. My children can go to school, and I can even work in my garden. Take a shower and then come back for more water if I want. I am bathing so well. A few of the men chuckled to hear a woman talk about bathing, but all I noticed was Helen's glowing face, the fresh flowers in her hair, and the lovely green dress she wore for special occasions. Touching her forearm, I replied, "Well, you look great." Yes. She paused, placing both hands on my shoulders and smiling. She said, "Now I am beautiful." That really hit me. My job is to focus on sustainable development, health, hygiene, and sanitation, to make sure Charity Waters projects are working in twenty years. But nowhere on any of my surveys or evaluations was a place to write. Today, we made someone feel beautiful. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you will have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen carefully. And answer questions eighteen to twenty. Before she had clean water, Helen would wake up before dawn, take her only two five-gallon jerry cans, and walk almost a mile and a half to the nearest water point, which happened to be at a school. Because there simply wasn't enough water for the area's population, she'd wait in line with hundreds of other women who also valued clean water. Helen's only other option was to skip the wait and collect contaminated water from a pond. Helen spent most of her day walking and waiting. She told me each day she'd say to herself, "How should I use this water today? Should I water my garden so we can grow food? Should I wash my children's uniforms? Should I use it to cook a meal? Should we drink this water?" With two children, one husband, and ten gallons, 
Helen had to make choices. I saw the shame in her eyes when she described how she would return from her long trek to find her two young children waiting for her. They were often sent home from school because their uniforms were dirty. With the new well in her village, her life was transformed. She now had choices, free time, options. Also, Helen had been chosen to be the Water Committee Treasurer, collecting nominal fees from 51 households to use for the maintenance of their well. Water committees are often the first time women are ever elected to leadership positions in villages. Last month, Helen was standing in line waiting for water. This month, she's standing up for her community. And now, she is beautiful. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear a conversation between a student, Jessica, and Dr. Kitching, a university advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Dr Kitching. My name's Jessica. I work for the student newspaper. I called you last week to ask if I could interview you for an article about how to ask for references. Oh, yes, I remember. Uh, come in, have a seat. Thank you. Do you have a few minutes now to do the interview? Yes, that's fine. Great. I got the idea to do this article because, well, everyone I know is rather puzzled about how to get references from professors when they need them for applications for jobs or postgraduate studies. And I thought since you're a professor and you've been working as a student advisor for many years also, what better person to ask? Yes, I have got some advice I can share on this topic. Where shall we begin? Uh, first of all, do you mind if I record our conversation? No, I don't mind. Thanks. Do you write many references yourself? Oh, yes, I certainly do. Let's see. It's variable, of course, but I'd say I average at least 50 per year. My goodness! That's nearly five per month. It's more than one per week. Yes, it's a lot. And of course, most of the requests are made in the spring or early summer, when students are starting to think seriously about where they'll be heading after they graduate in June. Do most professors do so many? Yes, it's part of the job. Of course, because I'm an advisor, students probably feel like I know them rather better than some professors, so I probably get a few more than I would otherwise. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. All right, so what do we students need to know in terms of asking for references or letters of recommendation? It's incredibly daunting, actually, particularly since we have such large classes. I'm not sure if my professors even know who I am. Yes, that's probably the biggest issue students face in getting references. You will invariably have to contact former professors, even if you have never spoken to them outside of class. Following on this, 
If I were giving a first-year student advice, I would say to make sure you've had contact with several professors outside of class so you won't be a stranger. All it takes is visiting during office hours, even if it's just to say, hello, I'm enjoying your lectures. But what if we didn't do that? Then you'll just have to contact your professor anyway. Make a telephone call. Tell him or her who you are and what classes you attended, this sort of thing. Remember, for your professor, recalling an average student out of hundreds and hundreds isn't easy. So tell him or her what course you took and what semester and year it was. Include what grade you got and anything memorable. Uh, perhaps you spilled your coffee. Though at the time it wasn't funny, it might be enough for Professor Brown to remember you and it won't shed any negative light on you. It was an accident. Or perhaps, although you never spoke outside of class, you went up and asked a question that was a great one. Any information you can give to identify yourself is going to help you out. Should I visit Professor Brown in person? Yes, that would be ideal. I would suggest giving the information first over the phone, then follow up by emailing it to your professor. During the phone conversation, ask if you could meet briefly. This will be both a physical reminder of who you are and also another chance to make a good impression. Isn't it very difficult to write references for all these students you've never spoken to or really even met? <laughs> yes. For example, I was recently called by a student from 20 years ago. He lived in another country. I really didn't recall him. He told me a little about himself and I looked back at his records. I told him that all I could do was verify that he was in my class, that he showed up for all the classes, and that he received a 3.4 in my class. Sometimes I'm very surprised that students who did very poorly in my class ask me for a reference. Hmm, what do you do in that case? Give a poor reference? I, like most professors I know, never say anything negative about the student. However, it is what is unsaid that can say it all. So you really want to make sure you're remembered in a positive way and have left a good impression. OK, thanks very much for all this information. The story should come out in our next printing, so if you're interested, I'll drop one copy over to you. Hmm, I'll be looking forward to seeing it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about the behaviour of primates, the group of animals that includes monkeys and humans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today's lecture will be about primate behaviour. Up until now, I've talked mostly about physical features, how they apply to living primates, how we use them for classification, how they apply to the fossil record. But human evolution isn't simply about how we've changed physically over the last 70 million years, 
It's also about how our behaviour has changed. Now, if I asked you to define what is meant by the term human, you could probably, hopefully, give me a list of characteristics that physically define us. But at a philosophical level, I would hope that what you'd be really proud of is not that we normally walk on two legs, but that we can reason and imagine. As Descartes put it succinctly, I think, therefore I am, although admittedly not quite in this context. This lecture isn't about human behaviour per se, but about primate behaviour in general, and animal behaviour too, since just as we can use the physical characteristics of living primates to give us clues and insights into the physical characteristics of human ancestors, so we hope that the behaviours of non-human primates will be similarly enlightening for the behaviour of our ancestors. To begin, let's talk a bit about primate cognitive abilities. I don't want to mention a lot of different behaviours without first mentioning cognition. Cognition is the amount of thought that goes into a behaviour. There is a world of difference between an animal hitting a nut with a rock and cracking it by accident, and an animal thinking to itself, I can't bite into this nut. I know, I need something to use as a hammer to crack it. However, it can be very difficult coming up with experiments to differentiate these two. We can easily test mental skills, such as recall and discrimination, using methods such as the Wisconsin General Test Apparatus and various training experiments. But it's much harder to work out the degree of thought required. This is still a big problem in evaluating the status of great apes. Just how nearly sentient are they? Sentient, for those of you who don't remember, means there is the presence of conscious thought. There are various behaviours that could be seen to support the presence of conscious thought in primates. Various sorts of altruism, or helping others without directly benefiting, can be found in certain great apes. The animals team up to achieve various goals, for example hunting in chimps. This would seem to require a degree of cognition. Another feature that has come to light recently is Machiavellian intelligence. Work especially with baboons, seems to indicate that there is a lot of deliberate social deception going on. Sneaky mating, passing the blame on to others, using infants for defence. At first glance, this seems very complicated behaviourally. But again, it can, just about, be explained in a fairly minimally cognitive way. Highly trained chimps, such as the signing chimp, Washo, and the computer-aided communication of Kanzi, also indicate a high level of intelligence. An interesting fact is that these language-trained chimps do much better in the standardised intelligence tests too, indicating that we probably underestimate primate intelligence in our traditional experiments. It seems that primates are not all that interested in the colour of pencils. They want to know the latest gossip about their friends. Sound familiar? And of course, cognition and intelligence in primates is a thorny problem with deep moral and political ramifications. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.